Hello, everyone. I'm Christy Risk, Senior Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator for today. The title of today's webinar is Collaboratively Designed Genomic Tools to Maximize Both Genetic Gain and Economic Efficiency in Aquacultural Breeding Programs, and our sponsor is Illumina. Our panelist for today is Dr. Clara, Ver Clara Verbola, a Director of Genomics and Breeding and Associate Vice President of Genetics at the Center for Aquaculture Technologies. You can type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the Q&A panel, which appears on the right side of the webinar screen. And if you look to the tray at the bottom of your window, you'll see a series of widgets to enhance your webinar experience. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Verbola. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Christy. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning to everyone on the call. It's currently 6 a.m. here in Australia. So please bear with me as the caffeine begins to kick in. I am delighted to be here today to be talking to you about collaborative genomic tools and the benefits that can result from their use. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge my co-author for this presentation, JR, who is the Director of Genetics Product Development at Neogen. I'd also take, like to take the time to acknowledge my colleagues at both CAT and Neogen who have made considerable contributions to the underlying content of this presentation for today. So just a little background about the Centre for Aquaculture Technologies, um, often known as CAT. CAT is focused on the application of technologies to improve productivity, efficiency and sustainability in the aquaculture industry. CAT is home to a unique combination of world-class scientists working together with complementary expertise across health, nutrition and genetics to deliver innovative tailor-made solutions for organisations across the aquaculture sector. Our research teams have team members located globally, including in Australia, Europe, Canada and the US, and the state-of-the-art facilities in San Diego and Prince Edward Island are equipped to support a diverse range of projects from discovery through to final product development and testing. So I assume everyone today on this call has an interest or a role in aquaculture and potentially is also exploring or already has taken on the um, and, and is interested in the potential of genomics and its role and the role it can play within aquaculture, the aquaculture sector and aquaculture industries. But before we specifically dive into those issues, I wanted to take a moment and step back and acknowledge we work in complicated and constrained systems and times as well. We have other objectives, be that to increase the rate of genetic gain, market share, productivity, welfare or efficiency. And sitting behind that is a set of finite resources. So we're thinking about money, people, time, operational limitations. And so the addition of any new complexity, such as genomics, we must be able to optimise this within our system to better drive us towards the objectives that we are trying to achieve. Even more so, we are actually not alone in our system. We sit within a part of a broader aquaculture industry. In the past, it may have been a necessity to design and build one's own genomics tools. But since then, we, as the aquaculture sector, have now built significant momentum across the industry to begin to have a conversation about how we better collectively leverage our collective knowledge and maximise the benefits we get from our investments in genomics. Our ability to do this will lead to better outcomes for all and drive growth of our sector and allow us to better compete for our share of the global protein market. So just to give you a little overview of the presentation today, so I'm going to start by giving you just a brief intro to talk about genomics and tools in breeding, why genomics and what are the potential applications. We'll then move on to talk about the design of genomic platforms, what are the key principles underpinning design, talk about the advantages of collaboratively built tools, and then we'll talk about one of the best examples or success stories of the use of these type of collaboratively built schools in the bovine industry. We'll then move 
a bit closer back to home and talk about a collaboratively built trip for Vaname and walk through the design, the benefits and the, and the results and benefits arising from that particular array. And then we will finish with a summary of the, comp of the presentation. So let's now talk a little bit about genomics in breeding. Genetic variation is the presence of differences in sequences of genes between individual organisms of a species. This variation enables both natural selection, the driving force behind evolution, as well as enabling genetic improvement by allowing us to select genetically superior individuals with respect to a specific set of desired characteristics, such as productivity, growth, or disease resistance. One really nice example of this is from the Brassica family, which is what you can see on the slide, when natural variation in genes was selected for resulting in six vegetables with distinctly different characteristics, all originating from the same wild mustard plant. Over time, it is possible to continuously select for these desired characteristics. This means that each generation, you improve the population's genetic merit through selecting genetically superior individuals. In the past, selection for genomic features that drive um, these characteristics was indirect. Often we used phenotype or relatedness to identify the next generation of breeding individuals or broodstock. However, it's now possible through genotyping tools to directly select these genomic features to right, drive the rate of genetic gain faster. These genomic features take the form of genetic or DNA variants. These variants can come in different forms. So you have sequence variants, which includes probably things you've heard of, such as single nucleotide polymorphisms or variants, often known as SNPs, as well as small insertions and deletions. There are also larger structural variants, which include the larger insertion and deletions, as well as inversions, duplications, and translocations. For the purpose of today's talk, we are gonna focus in on single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs and the genotyping platforms that utilize these particular variants. And it's also worth noting, the choice of this is often because SNPs are the most common DNA variant found. So if we think about SNPs as tagging or illuminating parts of the genome, they allow us to look across different individuals and see which different chromosome or DNA segments individuals are, are carrying, and we can refer them as different alleles. And see the different colors here would represent different alleles that individuals were carrying. And they allow us to characterize the variation between individuals. When we think about this in the context of genotyping platforms, we can have different densities. So for example, a low density genotyping platform using SNPs would be a couple of hundred SNP. A medium density array would be a few thousand and a high density array could be tens of thousands of SNPs, ten, tens to hundreds of thousands of SNPs. The functionality of the data that comes off these different size arrays increases with the number of markers. And so what you can see here is that the applications you can use the different density of, of arrays for varies. But generally, as you move up, the high density can do what the medium density and the low density can do as far as the application space. However, the number of SNPs you need for particular applications is heavily dependent upon the size and the complexity of the species of genome of which you are working. For example, Let's talk briefly about the shrimp genome. The shrimp genome has approximately 1.6 gigabase pairs, more than 26,000 genes and millions of SNPs. This again validates why SNPs are the marker of choice because they are numerous, located across the genome and linked with multiple and many DNA regions. As well as the fact that because they are located across the genome, they're hopefully in linkage with the, the the genes and the sections of DNA that influence trait expression and what we see from a phenotypic perspective. 
So what can you use genomics for within selective breeding? Well, ge genomic tools can be used for a range of actions. This includes population management, which looks at the health of your population by assessing diversity, inbreeding and population structure. Genomics can also be used to understand the relatedness in a population, either through assigning parentage, pedigree reconstruction or relationship estimation. High density SNP information from those high density arrays can be used for genome wide association studies, as well as selection studies, including marker assisted and genomic selection. Briefly, SNPs allow us to evaluate a population's health through assessing the variation present. Here you can see a set of individuals with all the same alleles for the SNP shown on the slide. This, if this was replicated across all other SNPs, this would likely indicate low diversity and high levels of inbreeding. However, for this set of individuals, you can see variation at all loci likely showing that the population has high diversity and low inbreeding. This is obviously a simplistic, simplistic representation, and there are a set of more complex metrics that would sit behind these assessments that can be used to look at a population's inbreeding and diversity. But if you have an interest in this and any of the other applications um, presented today, please do get in contact after the presentation for more details. So you can also use population structure to help inform breeding decisions through the use of genomics. The structure analyses look and determine how genetically different breeding lines are. And what you can see is two examples on the slide. The top plot shows three unique genetic signatures indicated by the colour across the plot and low divergence between the lines. In contrast, the bottom plot, you can see distinctly different colours for each of the lines showing high divergence between the lines and that each line is genetically unique. The management strategies resulting from looking at and understanding these particular genetic signatures would better and can be used to better inform your management of your population moving forward. One of the most common uses of DNA markers is for parentage. SNPs can be used very efficiently for parent assignment. The size of the panel required to do this is often quite low and can be less than 100 up to a couple of 100 SNP. Um, and while low density markers can very accurately assign a pedigree, so that is determine who lives mum and dad and for each of the progeny, Using high HD or high definition, high density genotypes, you can move on from just understanding this pedigree structure and knowing the expected proportion of shared DNA to utilizing markers located across the genome to calculate and the realized proportion of shared DNA. So for example, full siblings on average share 50% of their DNA. But if you think about a group of siblings you know, some will look more similar and some will look like they are unrelated. And this is because they share more or less than 50% of their DNA. And so if you look at the plot on the right hand side at the bottom, which is a, you've got the genomic relationship coefficient on the Y axis and the derived relationship. So the numerator relationship or the A matrix coefficients coming from the pedigree on the X axis. So at 0.5, there is a, a bar that goes up. And that's because everything that is a first order relationship, so mum to sibling, uh, to, to offspring, so parent to offspring or full sibs is assigned a 50% shared DNA within a pedigree structure. The beauty of the genomic information is it allows you to determine precisely that relationship. And all of a sudden you get this spread because they share more or less than 50%. And this is fundamentally useful if you think about being able to precisely estimate breeding values through genomic selection when you can now more precisely understand the relatedness of individuals within your population. Similarly, high density markers also allow you to search the genome for regions and genes linked to trait of traits of interest. So the way that this works is we would select a group of individuals and now we're not just trying to get the gen genomic information on these individuals, but we will also observe their phenotypes. This leads us to have paired, 
paired information on our individuals. So we have both genomic and phenomic information. And we then move on to perform analyses to look at for associations between a genotype and the phenotype. And we carry that out for all markers. And what you can see in on the right-hand side in the colourful plot, this is a Manhattan plot, each chromosome along the x-axis is represented in a different colour. And each spot or dot on the slide represents the significant significance of the association between that marker and the phenotype. What we are looking for is a stack of markers that sit on top with high significance. This indicates that that region of the genome is significantly linked to the trait of interest. And as you can see there with where the arrows point is that there are four key points of the genome that seem to be highly significantly linked to this particular trait. If these markers and these particular regions explain high proportions of the genetic variation, then we can move on to using them directly with any within any breeding strategy. And this is known as marker-assisted selection. So you take those markers, you would generate a platform that enables you to genotype them. And then using the example on the right-hand side of the slide, the red, the red labeled alleles are carrying um, alleles that are positively uh, positively affect the trait of interest. And so we've genotyped them in the parents and you can see that both the mother and father carry one positively linked allele. You then genotype these in your progeny or your selection candidates and you can see and track who is carrying these positive alleles. And so you can see the second individual is actually carrying both. So you would want to highly prioritise that individual for use as selection candidate, a breeding candidate into the future, as well as potential progeny one and four, which is carrying each carrying one of those positively linked alleles. However, marker-assisted marker selection is often not a viable option because the markers that you find are not often explaining high enough proportions of the genetic variants to use them in this context. So the alternative and the more sophisticated approach is to use genomic selection. So this relies on genome-wide markers from a high density array, for example, located across the genome. So instead of trying to just capture those peaks, we're trying to capture all of the genetic variation present for that specific trait. And so this can be done with an appropriate marker density. This can be done very effectively, even in the absence of phenotypic um, data collection and can significantly accelerate the rate of genetic gain. The way this works, again, we, for some individuals, known generally as the training population, we pair phenotype and genotypes together and we use that to generate what we call a prediction equation. So this creates the information we need to translate genotype to phenotype to produce the genetic merit of an individual, often known as a genome estimate, a genome enhanced breeding value or GBV. We can then use this prediction equation with selection candidates, which may only have genotypes to produce their respective GBVs. You can then rank as you would before, these individuals based on their GBVs for a trait, and you can select those with the desired characteristics you have to carry forward to produce the next generation. Genomic selection is also highly effective when it comes to the use of multiple traits. And so is a, is a, it's a very viable option in terms of driving genetic gain across multiple traits. The success of genomic selection is obviously very reliant on our appropriate genotyping platform, but it's also worth noting, like with um, genome-wide association study, it does require the accurate collection of phenotypes. So to summarise, genomics underpins a large number of the different approaches you can use within selective breeding programs. Those currently highlighted in green on the slide fundamentally rely on genotyping or sequencing tools. We can in fact extend it back as we talked about in terms of population management and genomics can be a very useful tool that can be applied within many mass selection programs as well. Excuse me. So let's now move on 
to talk about the design of genotyping platforms. So we would all know that not all tools suit every job and not all tools are created equal. So it's fundamentally important that we choose the right tool, in this case a genotyping tool, for use um, so that we can achieve success and, and, and the outcomes that we desire. So what are the key principles for the right genotyping tool? Well, obviously, as we discussed, the first key element is genome-wide coverage. And this is true actually of whether we're talking low density, medium density or high density. You, you want to have your markers evenly distributed across the genome so you can capture, even if it's a representation, the characterization of that genome and therefore the variation within your population. Not only do we want them to be located genome-wide, but we obviously want them to be informative. So we want them to be polymorphic. And in an ideal world, you would like a polymorphic marker on every segregating gen genomic segment within your population. And not only do we want them to be polymorphic, but we also would like them to have useful allelic frequencies. So the two plots that you can see on the slide, on the right-hand side, you can see a whole genome sequencing allelic frequencies. And you can see on the left axis, uh, the left side of the axis closest to the y-axis down the, the lower end, you can see an enrichment for rare alleles. This is typically what you get when you, when you do whole genome sequencing. However, if you compare this to the plot on the, on the left, which is what you get from a SNP array, when you design SNP arrays, you actually move from the enrichment of rare alleles to wanting a uniform, uniform distribution, such that the information you and, uh, and SNP you include are informative. Excuse me. Um, and you'll see there's a far less um, rare alleles included. This is fundamentally because for most applications of SNP chips, this is, yes, less useful information than those with a larger minor allele frequencies. In addition, often if they are, have low minor allele frequencies within breeding programs, they can be moving to fixation and they soon become non-informative. Finally, obviously, if we'd gone ahead and completed whole genome association studies, we would want to be including those key trait-linked markers that we've identified. So any putatively functional markers that we have identified, these would also go on our um, genotyping tool. And it probably doesn't need to be said, but all of these things need to be relevant to the population of interest. So the population that we're using, we would like all of those things to be relevant and useful to us. So let's now talk about the, what differentiates a collaborative genotyping tool from a custom tool. And these are the typical characteristics. So from a collaborative standpoint, as you would imagine, by the name collaborative, these are designed for multiple populations for broad utility in comparison to where a custom chip is typically designed for a target population. Both through a proper design process have the ability to offer optimal marker coverage. The second key component relates to the relationship between price and costs. So the, the relationship between, sorry, sample volumes and price. So much higher sample volumes are typically expected with a collaborative tip because, trip, chip because you have multiple users. So multiple populations are, are deploying the same tool and this drives up the sample volumes. This higher sample volume results in much lower costs or price. And this is true at both the design set and then the use in terms of price per sample. In comparison, typically, because your custom chip is designed for that target population, the sample volume has to come from that particular population. And that generally means that you achieve lower sample volumes. And this, as a subsequent result, can result in higher costs, both at the design and then the per sample stage. In addition, when it comes to a collaborative design, also resultant often from the higher sample volumes, it is actually possible to go back in and update a collaborative array. 
So you can go back here, and, uh, taking into account user um, feedback, and you can make adjustments in terms of the marker sets that are included on that platform. Additionally, new platforms are often possible. So either targeting particular parts um, of the port, of the of those those users or the application space based upon those results. And because of the high or the, the diffuse use of these particular platforms, the core of those of those um, designs is often carried forward, creating what we call forward compatibility with new platforms. In comparison, often custom chips are static, so they don't become become updated over time. And if it is a unique design that is not used by others, often you lose that forward compatibility because the core set of SNPs is not carried forward onto um, subsequent products that are designed outside that target population. One of the beautiful elements of a collaborative array is that it provides flexibility for the introduction of new diversity. So if you're running a breeding program and you need to introduce new genetics in, if you're using a collaborative tool, it's likely that no adjustments would need to be made and the tool would, would readily um, allow you to do so. In comparison, custom chips can be problematic if the new genetics is not fully captured within your chip array and you may have to start the process of redesign, uh, of designing it again. Finally, it's worth distinguishing um, the fact that custom arrays can actually be private or publicly available. The distinguishing feature with a collaborative array is the fact that it's publicly available at cost-effective pricing, so often up front is negotiated due to the known high sample volume that comes in behind a cost-effective pricing such that it can be offered um, cost efficiently to anyone who would like to use. So that it basically makes the array accessible to all. So now let's talk about one of the success stories when it comes to collaborative genotyping arrays, and this is within the bovine industry. So in 2008, the first Illumina bovine SNP 50B chip was released publicly, and this was a 50K chip marker. Subsequently, there were two um, additional arrays produced, um, both a lot high density and a low density uh, array. All of these were de developed collaboratively with worldwide partners, including some here in Australia, in France, and multiple entities across the USA. These chips were validated across 18 common beef and dairy breeds, and the platform supported many, if not all, genomic applications, including genomic selection across both the dairy and beef industries. And as we flagged, it was actually its widespread use that created high, created by high demand, it actually kept the cost samples very low and drove usage of these chips across multiple um, industries and entities. In addition, the fact that these were collaborative allowed for the production of new bovine products. And you can see a list of four there. And these are known as GeneSeq genomic profiler arrays. And there has been uh, these were all um, built upon the original Illumina B chips and they validated and retained most of the informative SNPs. So again, talking about that forward transferability. But they also were able to include new information that had been generated, including parentage, disease and trait link SNPs. They specifically targeted particular applications. So in this case, they were really interested in the genetics that were useful for selection and breeding and the management of populations. And so they were able to look at the information contained on the original SNPs, what was informative, what was not, what was missing, to further enhance the genotyping platforms that were available for the bovine industry. And so if we look at what the outcomes were from the bovine um, use of these collaborative arrays, so the plot on the left-hand side shows that the year that the uh, bovine 50K chip was publicly um, released. And the green line that you can see um, moving up is the number of genotype US Holstons, so a particular breed of dairy cattle um, in the US. And you can see that as that 
increases and it increases, accelerates over exponentially over time. You can also see on the blue line, which is the annual genetic improvement for milk, you can see prior to the genotyping, it was relatively flat and you can start to see an improvement. And so this is a product of the increasing amount of information that the genotyping of those individuals was providing within the genetic evaluations. Similarly, on the infographic on the right-hand side of the screen, this was released because in March 2021 this year, they had entered 5 million sires genotyped into their database for dairy within the USA. And you can see the acceleration at the rate of genotyping and the time it takes to reach each of those particular milestones. But again, they're now able to genotype and use and use substantial numbers of um, genotyped individuals within their genetic evaluations, further driving the rate of genetic gain. Um, and as you can see at, um, in the dot point on the top of the screen, uh, Neogen report that they have uh, processed more than 5 million of these bovine, collective bovine arrays since 2013. So you can readily see from all of this information, the uh, the uptake of these collaborative arrays has been enormous, but also the results that have come from it um, validate the use and the design of these collaborative type tools. So the key take home message, I guess, from this component is that there has been many groups across the globe that have benefited from these collaborative type arrays. And the key element is that this demonstrates that the differentiation success that everyone wants to achieve is actually coming not through the tool itself, but it's through how the tool is deployed. So you can achieve the same outcomes with a collaborative and a custom tool if it's used correctly and you have the additional information structure within um, the application space to deploy it successfully. So we're now going to come back a little bit closer to home and talk about the Aqua Array HD Vatami, which is an example of a collaborative um, genotyping platform in aquaculture for Vatami shrimp. So in terms of talking about this, I'm going to walk you through the design um, process, um, some validation results, and then talk about the benefits. So if we think about um, the array design, um, it began with sequencing. So RADSeq and whole genome sequence were performed on multiple um, populations across the globe, and this was used to design a high density screening array. Samples from multiple global populations were then genotyped on the screening array, and you can see those highlighted in colour in the world map um, with multiple populations often sampled within an individual country. And based on the data from this screening array, um, new markers were selected for the 50K design. The four key elements of this design were the inclusion of SNP from previous panels, um, and this was to ensure that they were they took the, we took the core informative SNPs, and this was to ensure there was an overlap between the SNP sets, again, that forward translation, and so that past data could be seamlessly combined with data from the new array. The second key element was the identification of key causative SNPs for a range of growth, tolerance, and disease resistance traits. Finally, coverage was addressed at both the population-specific and the general level to ensure optimal outcomes. So local optimization algorithms were used to select SNPs in genomic regions based on location and minor allele frequencies, again, looking for those informative markers, in addition to population-specific SNP, which were identified to enhance the SNP coverage and combined with the more generally selected set to ensure optimal coverage for all populations. So the outcomes of this design were, and you can see these in the technical spec bottom on the left-hand side, were 6,500 SNPs from previous arrays that were published and shown to known to be informative for whole genome-wide so genome association study and genomic selection. There were also just under 43,500 quality SNPs that were selected for coverage as well as population-specific um, 
representation, and these were strategically spaced across the genome. In addition, there were 60 putative functional SNPs for ammonia tolerance, growth, and disease resistance. The plot on the right-hand side shows the density of SNPs within one megabase window size, and you can see that's highly variable, as you would expect, because obviously there are areas of the genome that are enriched and more highly polymorphic than others, and others that are conserved. But again, the beauty of a collaboratively designed chip is in those regions where perhaps there isn't as much coverage as possible, additional, um, if additional information came to write or possibilities about new markers, these could be added to the chip and further evolved, further improving the platform as we moved forward. So what has the AquaRay HD Vanamai been used for so far? Well, it's been successfully used for the characterization of inbreeding and relatedness, um, as well as parentage assignment. Whole genome-wide association studies have been undertaken and been able to identify key genomic regions relating to specific traits of interest. And it's also been reported by a number of clients that genomic selection is able to improve the rate of genetic gain for the key traits within their selected breeding programs. These applications have been validated in multiple populations within the USA, Ecuador, and Thailand. And the plot on the right-hand side, you can see um, the number of markers is listed on the y-axis. The x-axis is obviously the, the five populations. The gray bar is the loci with, loci with a call rate of greater than 80%. And by call rate just means not missing. So 80% or more of the 50,000 markers had genotypes called for them. The dark blue bar, which is the second bar along in each of the, the clusters, is uh, the loci with a call rate, again, greater than 80%, and again, a minor allele frequency greater than 1%. And the light blue bar is loci with a call rate of greater than 80% and a minor allele frequency of 5% this time. And the key message, the take-home message here is that you can see that many markers close to the 50,000 have a call rate of greater than 80%. In terms of informative or the minor allele frequency, you can see that there is a general similarity across all the populations in terms of the performance. So they're all reporting very similar numbers of informative markers with a minor allele frequency of both 1% and 5%. And so you can see that in, for these sets of populations, the chip is working equitably across all and providing adequate coverage um, with no, no one population favoured. So the design has worked well in this instance. So in terms of thinking about the benefits of such tools, um, collaborative genomic tools, as we've kind of seen with the bovine example, as well as the Vanamai, have been proven to deliver genetic benefits when included as part of a genotyping strategy. Genomic selection and the use of an appropriate genotyping array, high density normally, can deliver for low to moderately heritable traits, such as disease resistance, increases in genetic gains of sometimes more than 50%. High density genotyping can be a key component of a well-designed genomic strategy within a breeding program that is seeking to accelerate the rate of genetic gain while also managing the population for diversity and inbreeding. However, there are other key components that will determine success. As I said, it's not just the tool, it's the way that you use it. And one of these is also um, clearly phenotyping. So in the age of genomics, it would be remiss of me not to say that phenotype is considered king. So again, your genotype is only as good as your phenotype. And so precise phenotyping is fundamental in terms of achieving any of the success when it comes to things like genomic selection or genome-wide association studies. The economic benefits of such collaborative arrays we've already touched on multiple times, but if we want to use the Aqua Array HD Vanamai as a specific example, the cost per price per sample was negotiated up front due to a known sample volume and therefore the costs were able to be kept extremely low. So um, this um, particular array can be accessed for $20 per sample. Um, and in comparison to a custom design chip, 
this is in fact a dependent on sample volume can be 50%, 50, will be 50 to 80% saving on price compared to a custom array. So just before we start to wrap up, I'll let you know that the Centre for Aquaculture Technologies has a range of aqua, a line of aqua array uh, genotyping tools from low density, medium density up to high density. And so if you have a genotyping need, I'd encourage you to have a look and see whether or not there are some um, arrays currently available that could be used. But in addition, um, from a high density standpoint, we're currently in the process of looking to develop similar to the uh, Vanamay chip, uh, collaboratively tool, collaborative, uh, collaborative genotyping platforms, excuse me, for barramundi, Pacific oysters and tilapia. So if you have any samples and you are interested in contributing um, to a collaboratively designed genotyping array, uh, please get in contact after the presentation. We would love to hear from you. So just to summarise, um, the key advantages, as I see it, of the collaboratively designed arrays are that they're for use across populations, but they can also deliver optimal designs. So you're not losing out in anything. It's designed well. It should function and be able to provide you with the data you need for the applications for which you wish to use it, be it genomic selection or genome-wide association studies, marker selection or even parentage. As we've discussed multiple times, the high sample volumes keeps the prices low, which from an economic standpoint is fundamentally important. They've been demonstrated to be highly effective in terms of um, their use for different genomic applications. And the one of the key um, advantages is obviously the ability to update the panel, as well as contributing to the um, understanding and knowledge about the genome structure of that particular species, which can also result in new products. So finally, I'd just like to reiterate the point that I made at the start of the presentation, which is that as the aquaculture industry, it's imperative that we think about how we can leverage our collective knowledge and maximise the benefits we get from our investments in genomics. So please, before you go away and think about building a new SNP array, consider talking to us at CAT or really any genotype provider to see if a collaborative platform may be a viable, economically efficient solution to your genotyping needs. So with that, I will finish up. Um, I thank you very much for your time um, and I will hand over to Christy and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Verbola. As a reminder to webinar participants, if you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. And before we begin the Q&A, we'd like to ask attendees to take a moment after the webinar has ended to give us feedback by taking our exit survey. Okay, let's launch into our questions. Um, so, Clara, can you comment on the potential for uh, whole genome sequencing to potentially overtake chips um, based on their price and throughput? Certainly, that's an it's an excellent question, and I think um, long term that is likely the, the the way that things will go in terms of I think whole genome sequencing will become the way of the future. But I think the beauty of of actually um, the collaboratively designed chips as well is we're building a, a knowledge base that we can use and move that forward when we actually do move to sequencing. Because obviously, with sequencing, that will allow us to capture all chips. So it's in some ways it's the chip to rule them all when we move to whole genome sequencing. Um, okay, great. And how long does it typically take to put together a collaborative array? That's a great question. Um, so in terms of, of the steps that it takes to put together a collaborative array, it's very similar to a custom chip. So the to design, the time frame would be the same. Um, so the first step would obviously to make sure you have the samples that you need. You would then do sequencing um, and SNP discovery. Um, and then that would then move on to chip design and then manufacturers. So in total, I think the time frame would be approximately four to six months. And you could obviously fast track components of that. So the sponsors Illumina may be able to help you out with, with fast tracking that a little bit big, quicker, but typically I'd say it's about four to six um, months in terms of from start to finish. 
And have you ever selected an optimized SNP arrays for growth in specific populations? Is that something that that you would ever find useful, or that you've ever done, um, or, or that you could collaborate with someone on doing? I personally have not, but certainly there is the potential to do so. So if you have the information that kind of flags which parts of the genome that you're doing, you can actually you could you could optimally design that, and certainly that would be interested. We would be very interested in collaborating collaborating with someone if that was their primary aim in terms of their development of a of a SNP array. Um, do you charge a cost to collaborators for building a collaborative chip? And um, how often would you expect for collaborative arrays to be updated? That's a good question. Again. Um, Typically, no, we would not charge for the design of a collaborative array. So we would we would cover that cost up front because obviously we're, you, we're designing it for the industry. Um, unfortunately, with a custom chip, the design cost would, would not be covered. And in terms of updating the chip, um, we would, uh, on average, I think we would be able to redesign or update the chip every two years. Great. And how confident are you that you can build a collaborative array for a new, uh, a new species uh, that works broadly ac across breeding populations? I think based on our experience to date, um, we'd be fairly confident that this was possible. Um, it obviously depends on how much information is readily available and um, how much information was known on the species and the particular um, relationships between those um, populations. But I think the beauty of going through the design process is as we actually did sequencing and 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 develop, gathered the data and put that together, we would then be able to assess the likely success during the process. And so should it be at any point it be discovered where we don't think that's going to particularly work or there may need to be two types of arrays to better represent the diversity within the multiple populations, that would be caught during the design process and so we could adjust our strategy based on the data feedback that would occur. Great. Um, I believe those are all the questions that we had in the queue. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up there. Uh, we'd like to thank Clara Verbola and our sponsor, Illumina. Um, as a reminder, please look out for the pop-up survey after you log out to provide your feedback. And as always, if you missed any part of this webinar or wish to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. Thank you for joining us for this genome webinar.